you're all set. Okay. Uh, as uh, Heather said, I'm Lance Yonkos. I'm a, a new assistant professor in environmental science and technology. Um, I'm not going to talk much about nutrients, so I'm hoping you guys have sort of a, a uh, primer into the other contaminants of concern that are of interest in poultry manure, uh, which has been the main focus of my work. Uh, I, as Heather mentioned, I worked at the Y Research Center, and that's where most of the research that I'm going to discuss came from, but I'm now here at College Park in environmental science and technology. Uh, and the projects that I'm going to describe were largely funded through the, the Hughes Center for Agroecology uh, and with some EPA star grant funding. Uh, my title here, Poultry Manure Induced Endocrine Disruption, uh, reflects a, a series of studies we've done. And of course, first up, that means we need to get a handle on the idea of what endocrine disruption is, or what an endocrine disruptor is. Uh, and this notion, it's been bandied around for a while. The World Health Organization put together this collective definition that's rather complex, an exogenous or external substance or mixture that alters the functions of endocrine systems and has adverse health effects on organisms and their progeny. Uh, but in truth, what we're talking about is any kind of chemical that's found in the environment, whether it's in an aqueous media for a fish exposure or whether it's inhaled or whether we ingest it, uh, this applies to humans certainly as well, that alters the normal development or reproduction or some other kind of endocrine mediated function. And where I care about this is largely with aquatic communities with fish, so the exposure is going to be in receiving waters. And the things that might be altered include growth and development and reproduction, things that would be driven by growth hormones or re reproductive hormones, but also metabolism or osmoregulation, and even behavioral effects, whether it's breeding or predator avoidance that could lead to, to reduced populations thriving and so forth. Uh, this was a controversial topic as recently as, as a few years ago, whether endocrine disruption actually exists. Uh, and of course, it, it's kind of a silly statement because we've known and in fact intentionally done this for, for many decades. Female birth control pills are the perfect definition of endocrine disruption, using a synthetic estrogen to modify the normal functioning of the reproductive system. Uh, and this is used in veterinary uh, applications, obviously, as well. And the flip side is, is just as obvious. This is uh, Needless to say, synthetic androgens are certainly capable of putting on muscle mass, which is also used in, in animal agricultural applications. So we've understood this. Uh, the larger question is whether incidental exposure or releases to the environment of EDCs or endocrine disrupting compounds can actually have effects. And this has become fairly obvious from a lot of different systems now. First, in, in sewage treatment plants, the effluents, mostly in England, the first research came out, showing that these synthetic birth control uh, compounds, ethyl estradiol specifically, would remain in the effluent and would actually feminize fish within the receiving waters. And once people started looking, and we've reproduced those studies in the United States uh, since then, and a lot of other sources of contaminants that have been shown to be estrogenic or androgenic, uh, downstream of, of uh, effluents from bleach craft mills and pulp and paper mills, uh, manufacturing and processing waste with detergents, all of these have been found to be reasonably estrogenic, nothing compared to the, the native compounds that come out, the actual estradiols that are, are naturally produced. Uh, some things are, are intentionally uh, hormonal. For, for example, agricultural pesticides, many of them, their mode of action is intentionally to mimic a, an insect hormone, either a molting uh, inhibition or, or growth promotion or something that will disrupt their cycle. So obviously residuals of this, if they enter the environment, might have impacts on non-target species. And you're probably all aware of the, the controversy around bisphenol A and its uh, residence in plastics and it leaches into to, materials that we might drink, and it's been shown to be estrogenic. And in fact, many countries, Canada and, and most of the EU, has banned it for use in most uh, drinking and, and, and uh, food-grade plastic applications. We have not as yet, but it's probably coming. Uh, but where we get interested is when you start talking about animals and confined animal feeding operations, most specifically. Uh, the three big categories, swine lagoons, I list some locations, although this is in no way inclusive. North and South Carolina and Arkansas obviously have substantial swine production 
uh, going on, but also beef in the Midwest. These are treated with trimbolone, which is a synthetic androgen, and it is released, uh, it is excreted and, and enters surface waters and so forth. And where we really care around here is with poultry litter. Uh, most abundantly on the eastern shore, but it's a growing industry and therefore in other areas on the Shenandoah and the Potomac rivers and so forth. You guys are all, I'm sure, very aware of just what poultry litter is, the, the waste manure, but also bedding material and, and uneaten food, feathers, whatever else might accumulate within a poultry house. Uh, I have some numbers here. The ranges are pretty big, but between the, the older and more modern poultry houses up to maybe 35,000 birds, multiple flocks over several years, the, the abundance that accumulates. The thing that's so complicated about it is many of the compounds that we're interested in change, uh, some rather quickly, some rather slowly. So at any given time, given that this material varies in age, you're going to have a lot of different potential concentrations of different kinds of compounds. Uh, I'm going to throw out some poultry facts real quick. Uh, these were derived from the, the Delmarva Poultry Industry website to, to make a, an interesting case here. These are facts from basically changes in the industry from 1925 to 2000. And they're fairly remarkable to me. The notion the average days uh, to, to get a bird to market has gone down from 112 to only 46 in that time frame, so much less than half. And in that time, the birds, the weight has gone up from two and a half pounds to five pounds finished weight. So they basically doubled. The feed to meat ratio in pounds, uh, a pound, or uh, to, to produce a pound of meat has gone down from almost five pounds to less than two. So remarkably efficient. And the mortality in the birds has gone down. So all of these speak to the fact that we can produce a lot more birds, a lot faster, heavier birds, and so forth. And per bird or per pound, they produce a lot less waste. So in, in a sense, that's an improvement. But the thing that challenges us is this. And in fact, I didn't have 1925 numbers. But from 1950 to 2000, just looking at broilers, the production went up uh, more than 20-fold. So even though we have these substantial and incremental changes in, in the amount of litter we're producing, the sheer abundance of it makes it a challenge to deal with. For the Delmarva fact, something like 600 million birds produced annually, which is about 7% of the U.S. total. Uh, we need to keep in mind that the Delmarva Peninsula represents a, a fraction of 1% of the, of the land area, so that's quite an abundance if this material doesn't travel too far from the shore. Uh, the amount of manure produced, about 700 million kilograms. Uh, and as you guys are aware, it's, it's generally land applied locally to satisfy nutrient requirements for corn production. And obviously, if it's applied incorrectly or excessively or, or, or in some fashion, it can cause severe impacts on regional water quality. So this is the fairly standard conversation about nutrients as they're associated with poultry litter. Uh, but there are a lot of other things that, that are potential concern. Bacterial and viral pathogens have to be kept in mind, obviously. Uh, feed additives are a big player in this. Uh, until very recently, arsenic was a, a, a conversation. It's no longer being used in, in, as a feed additive and therefore should probably cease to be much of a topic here in, the, in Maryland anyway. Uh, a lot of therapeutics, though, antibiotics and other things are used in, in pretty substantial amounts. They're proprietary, so you don't exactly know at any given time what's going to be used. And there is a threat, to, obviously, with these that the residuals, if they get into the environment, could modify the microbial communities, could lead to, to antibiotic resistant or pathogenic bacteria that lead to more challenging uh, and difficult to treat infections and so forth. So that's obviously a concern. And then again, where I really am interested is with the, these fecal steroids, natural <coughs> fecal steroids, estradiol being the most potent uh, and this is in the birds, in the fish that I'm going to describe, and in us, it's the exact same compound. It is structurally identical. So needless to say, if it's functional in the birds, it can potentially be functional in us and, and in fish as well. Uh, estrone, a slightly less potent estrogen, but still a, a very potent animal estrogen. And testosterone, uh, the, the most potent of the animal uh, androgen. And these are, just to make sure, these are naturally occurring. This is a product of the bird's metabolism. 
the poultry in the houses are, are growing fast. They are excreting, uh, producing an abundance of, of steroids and excreting them. So they are present within the manure. These are not any kind of steroidal amendment of any sort. Uh, we've looked at, and there's a lot of literature on this, but we've measured from a number of litter sources locally, and some were aged in different ways, some were from hen houses and so forth. Of about eight that we had some data on, the average 17-beta uh, estradiol was about 125 nanograms per gram. Testosterone was on about 50 nanograms per gram. And those of you who are pretty savvy are saying, well, that's, that's pretty low. I mean, we're measuring in parts per billion here. Uh, and you would imagine in runoff scenarios that in truth we're, we're probably getting concentrations in surface waters that are in the part per trillion range. Uh, but the challenge, of course, is that these are very bioactive compounds. They are designed to function at exceedingly low concentrations. So these low part per trillion ranges are actually uh, potentially uh, able to affect fish and other biota if they get exposed. So with this in mind, there was a lot of evidence when we first started doing this work, we thought we would look into these potential effects. And we designed a series of, of experiments. Uh, we started out working in the laboratory. Uh, my numbers are actually off here. I list two dozen bioassays. By now, we've probably done maybe closer to three dozen. We've looked at a number of fish species. We're up to, to four or five now. Uh, exposed a lot of different ways for different durations, sometimes in fairly complex flow-through scenarios, sometimes just a static batch that's made up and the fish are put in. Uh, and we've looked at them at a lot of different ages, everything from very young, just post-hatch larval fish uh, that are still going through sensitive periods of, of uh, sexual differentiation and development. And we've looked at mature males especially, since estrogenicity seems to be the bigger player in this. We've looked at breeding groups. Uh, and the whole intention, of course, is to try to get an idea of what exposure to these might cause so that we can then take that information and go out in the field and look to see if we're seeing similar things. Uh, the materials we've most frequently used has just been raw um, material from a, a whole house clean out, the, the things I showed you before. But we've also worked with some pelletized poultry litter. And we've even used some biosolids. We've just started getting into some work with that. Uh, I think I saw someone asking a question about whether composting is particularly effective at dealing with, especially with antibiotics and other pharmaceuticals. Uh, we have just started looking into this, and in a very preliminary study with some biosolids, we showed a, a pretty high uh, efficacy of reducing these things, about, a, about an order of magnitude reduction of the several antibiotics that we were able to measure. We haven't done this with poultry litter yet, so the, the jury's still out. As far as pelletizing, it seems to do the exact opposite. Uh, it isn't hot enough to, to have any kind of thermal uh, reduction in, in these compounds. And because it essentially sterilizes it and dries it out, it tends to, to make things last even longer. So that's not particularly effective as a solution if, it, if the attempt is to try and remove contaminants. For most of our lab studies, our, our workhorse here was the fathead minnow, Thermophiles promulus. This is a, a very common freshwater laboratory species for running tests. And there's a number of advantages for it. First of all, it takes very well to culturing in the laboratory. Uh, we can trick it into thinking it's summer all the time, and, and we get very fast growth out of it. So from a, a larval fish to, to reproductive, uh, uh, to sexually reproductive and mature can be as, as short as four or five months. Uh, but one of the best things is that they are sexually dimorphic you can distinguish the male fish from the female fish. And if you look at, at this, this is a male. You see what are called nuptial tubercles. These are the bumps on the, on the nose and the dark black color on the head. This is clearly indicative of a reproductively mature male fish. And that's very useful if we're looking for anything that might impact the capacity of, of male fish. So uh, the biological indicators that we have worked with and, and developed uh, generally are looking at feminization of males. Uh, I have to admit that I have never actually caused one to grow long flowing hair and so forth, but, but the, the tools that we have used, one of the, the, the easiest anyway, is looking for a compound uh, called vitelligenin. This is a high molecular weight lipoprotein, and it's produced in the liver of female fish 
uh, migrates to the, the ovary, and this is what matures the egg and serves as, as the yolk, as the nutrition for the developing embryos and larval fish. Uh, and basically, until their mouth parts are competent so they can go out and feed themselves, they need this available as, as their fuel. So obviously, it's very important for females to have a mechanism to develop this, but there's really no reason for males to have this. Uh, and in, in nature and certainly in laboratory settings, when everything's running right, they will not have any of this, or so it'll be a trivial amount. But the, the interesting thing is they still have the genetic capacity. The liver can be inspired if it is exposed to an external estrogen to start producing this. And since they don't have an ovary and they don't have any eggs, this stays within their system. So it builds up in the liver and sometimes in the kidney, and it can be found within the plasma in the blood. So it makes it a very sensitive tool where we can actually collect this plasma and we have a, a, an antibody specific and a ELISA enzyme linked immunosorbent assay where we're able to actually quantify the amount of vitelligenin that's within these fish. And this functions as a very sensitive tool for detecting if they've been exposed to some kind of estrogen in the water. Uh, and I'm going to run through, I have lots of data and I'm going to give you just a tiny subset of it but some of the results from the various tests we've run along the, the past few years. So in looking at vitelligenin, uh, if you look at the graph on the left, uh, looking at the x-axis, what I call my low plaques, this is poultry litter associated contaminants, that's a reflection of, of my lack of knowing what's actually in this material. Trying to measure and quantify estrogens, there are a lot of varieties of these estrogens, they arrive in comp, uh, conjugated forms that are very difficult to quantify. They change over the course of your exposure. So this is simply me estimating an amount that is very reminiscent of what we generally find in runoff. Uh, and that's based on measuring nutrients and ammonia and, and many other things. Uh, so what I call my low plaques exposure is a pretty average runoff scenario. And then what I call a high plaques exposure is what I, at least at the time, thought of as a worst case scenario a really hard rain event that caused copious amounts of runoff immediately after poultry litter application, for example. Uh, and then my E2 control, this is actually running a positive control with a potent estrogen, something that we knew would cause something to, for comparative purposes. And you can see, as the asterisks show, all of these are significantly higher. This is a log uh, increase on the, the y-axis. So this is three to, to five orders of magnitude increases in the amount of vitelligenin suggesting obviously that there's an awful lot of these estrogens or at least enough of these estrogens to inspire a pretty substantial induction of vitelligenin in these male fish. If you look on the, the graph on the right, this was some subsequent work looking at poultry litter from different integrators, so Allen's and Purdue and Tyson. And this was actually looking at the liver itself and measuring the VTG mRNA, the expression of the RNA that was ramping up to cause the production of the vitelligenin. This is nice because it actually happens on a faster time scale. Two or three days is all that's required to get this to, to start showing up. And you can see here, again, that in all of these instances, we saw an awful lot of vitelligenin being produced. Uh, another way that we can look at this, if you're starting with mature or almost mature animals and you expose them for some period of time, and then you actually look at the testes, so on the right, these are cross sections, uh, histological sections. They are stained so that we can distinguish the different uh, cellular components of them. And this is the testes of male fish. The dark blue color are actually mature spermatozoa within the seminiferous tubules. So this represents fish that are, are ready to spawn when you start seeing a lot of this. And for comparative purposes, the control, you see more than half of the, the cross-sectional area has mature sperm in it. Uh, so this, this fish is very much ready. Uh, and this is a pretty extreme case, but if you see the estradiol control, only 8% of mature sperm representing the cross-sectional area. So a dramatic reduction. Uh, and in our poultry litter exposures, at least in the case of the high poultry litter exposure, we ended up seeing a, a small, but nevertheless a statistically significant reduction in the amount of this. And this would suggest that they're not quite as mature and ready to spawn. Uh, and likely that reflects the fact that they were bathed in, in an estrogenic exposure for some period of time. Probably the most concerning of all of these is looking at developmental issues that occur 
with the testis or with the gonad in general and with gender differentiation when you do early life exposures. And if you look at the, the three images on the right, starting at the top, uh, this is a cross-section through the entire body cavity of uh, a two-month-old fish. And what you're looking at is the testis. It's very obvious. It, it would be a long, slender piece of tissue, but in cross-section, it would be a little bulbous piece attached with this one sort of stout point of attachment to the body wall. And that's a pretty standard appearance for, for the testis. If you look at the middle picture, this is a very standard appearance for a developing ovary. And what you have are two points of attachment to the body wall, what the arrows indicate, and you see developing eggs inside of that. And they're very different, obviously, from, from the male. And then contained within these two points of attachment is the oviduct. So when these eggs are mature and this fish is ready to spawn, they get deposited into this oviduct, which allows them to then exit the fish and, and not be lost into the body cavity. And even in the bottom image, we have an immature female which has a, an apparent oviduct, but there's no egg, so we can't confirm from the cell types, but we still have this classic female-type body morphology. So exposing fish from about two days post-hatch for 21 days, which spans the window where they are going through sexual differentiation, uh, if you look at the, the graph on the left, starting with the estradiol control, which was a, a fairly potent, uh, obvious estrogen, the entire population of, in this case, it would have been about 60 fish in, in these particular groups, was feminized. So 100% had this female-type body morphology. And looking down the various poultry litter exposures, the high one, more than 90%, had a female-type body morphology. The medium slightly increased over uh, what you would anticipate of a 50-50 uh, male-to-female ratio. Uh, the low poultry litter seemed to fall right about on that 50-50. So, well, excuse me, one other thing that we, that we wanted to look at uh, was any kind of gonadal abnormalities that might occur in the mature fish. Uh, and the most common is intersex. You guys have probably heard about this uh, in the news recently in relation to, to fish that are being collected in the Potomac especially, uh, and I'll discuss that in a little bit. But this is the occurrence of immature eggs within an otherwise normally developing testis. Uh, it's referred to as testicular oocyte in this case. This isn't something that's terribly common in fathead minnows. We found several that had this, but they weren't related to exposure particularly. Uh, the literature has mentioned that it does happen in some instances, but this isn't something we saw with these fish. But later when I talk about some of our field work, I'll describe where that plays in. Uh, the big take-home message from all of these laboratory studies uh, and there was a lot of variety depending on how we handled the fish and the times we exposed and so forth. But generally, the consensus is that inducing patellogenin in mature male fish is rather easy. These poultry litter associated contaminants certainly have sufficient estrogenicity to cause that. Uh, depending on the time of exposure and for the duration, you could inhibit gonadal maturation in male fish, which also obviously indicates presence of some kind of estrogen. Uh, but most especially that in very early life exposures, you can feminize the male gonadal development. Uh, and the consequence of that, while we haven't grown these all the way to adulthood and done breeding experiments, which would, would might be meaningful, it certainly has the possibility of leading to a population level effect. So we took these ideas and started going out into the field, uh, or at least what I'm going to call our controlled field studies. This is the Y Research and Education Center. Um, you can see with all of the various research fields and so forth. The thing that's telling about this is how intimately associated this, this agriculture is with the aquatic environment. Uh, whether we have adequate buffers and so forth, we still see that the predominant land use is agriculture and the receiving bodies are very close. The research fields that we've worked with now for almost 10 years uh, and in truth, I I've co-opted them and, and gotten my information. Ken Staver is the main guy who's been working on these for most of the past 30 years doing nutrient-related studies. But the advantage we have, this is a single field that's about 70 acres, has a raised berm that separates it into two watersheds. If you look at the one to the upper right, uh, we label this no-till because it is typically uh, cropped using a no-till uh, strategy. 
this has a grass filter strip that collects the, the vast majority of all of the, the water that runs off of this. It crosses a, a small road, goes through a retention pond, and then eventually off to a, an estuarine system and a marsh system past that. Uh, on the lower left, this is what I call the conventional till field because it has traditionally been uh, uh, conventionally tilled in these studies has a similar grass filter strip and then it drains off into a different estuary. So what we've been able to do is compare using these two fields but cropping them in, in different strategies and competing strategies and look at what kind of contaminants come off of these. And most of the studies have been looking seasonally or year-round at total amount of nutrients that are leaving the system. Our biggest interest has been after poultry litter application looking at the effects uh, after the first couple of rain events, because the things we're most interested in tend to dissipate after those first several events. Uh, generally, using whole house cleanouts from a standard boiler operation, so the, the accumulated material, sometimes in the order of about 200 tons, would be delivered to us. We would get it maybe several weeks or months prior to application, so we would have to cover it. And then pretty traditional, about 3,000 kilogram per acre application. And the various things we've looked at over the years, we started out with our no-till, where the, the crop residues are, are killed back with Roundup, but left intact. The soil surface is largely intact, and the litter is applied directly on the surface. Conventional tillage, where the cover crops are, are worked in, and the litter is applied, and then it's disked in, so it's mixed probably to a depth of about 20 centimeters. And you guys are, I assume, well aware that the motivations for doing these largely have to do with no-till, especially with, with reducing erosion and soil loss. But there is a risk that applying, especially an abundance of poultry litter like this directly on the surface, that anything that's water-soluble is, is likely to be suspended and can be washed off. Uh, and this is where some of these additional strategies come in. Turbo-till functions. To, to sort of be an in-between measure where you end up leaving much of the crop residue intact, but you disk the, the poultry that are in to a, a few inches anyway. And that tends to be helpful. Uh, and then the subsurface injection, while challenging, and, and we've tried to do this quite a while, we've only had one occasion that we were able to get a hold of a subsurface injector, uh, and it was a, a, a um, sort of pilot scale model, and it was a very slow process. But this actually cuts the furrow and, and deposits the litter subsurface down to about 8 to 10 inches and folds it back over so that the uh, cover crop is largely intact and the poultry litter is not on the surface. Uh, and obviously that has benefits. So in doing these, uh, we then stand around and wait for it to rain. We don't have any irrigation on these fields, so we're reliant on on a rain event sufficient to produce runoff. And in some years, it happened very quickly. In some years, we waited uh, in drought years. Application might have happened in the middle or early May, and we didn't see rain until August. Uh, on this occasion, in 2008, you recall I described our worst case scenario, my high poultry litter exposure. Uh, in truth, I, I underestimated substantially. This was a rain event in 2008. Two days after we applied litter, we got about five centimeters of rain, and the amount of runoff, uh, the, the concentration based on ammonia and other things were about five times higher than anything I had imagined in my laboratory exposures. Um, when we tried to do field exposures with this, we had to do a five-fold dilution just to get the ammonia levels down to non-lethal concentration. So this would have been, I would say, far and away our, our worst-case scenario. But once it does rain and we get this runoff, uh, we come in and start collecting this material for various things, to, to have it analyzed to determine the actual estrogen concentration, but also to, to use it for animal exposures, to bring it back to the lab. In some cases, we froze it. In some cases, we left it to, to degrade naturally and so forth. And we even caged fish within this receiving pond, uh, which gave us a, the opportunity to see what would happen with natural degradation, with with photolysis and, and changes in temperature and so forth. And we did this a number of times, so, so these studies were repeated as best as possible. Uh, just a quick subset of the data from that, we again saw VTG gene expression in male exposures, 
depending on how long we expose them for up to, to four to eight days and so forth. Uh, sometimes we, we cut our exposures off maybe a little too short, but there was sufficient estrogenicity to produce patelogenin in these guys. Uh, and you can see, especially on the right-hand side here, the plasma BTG, a nine-day exposure, we got a significant induction in these fish. As far as the actual abundance of estrogen, uh, this is a catch-all slide here. There's a lot of challenges to measuring these. You measure the estradiol as a parent compound, but it has a variety of conjugates that are present. These are deconjugated through microbial action, so as time goes on, you actually see an increase in abundance within the water before it starts to degrade completely. But without going into too much detail, trying to compare apples and apples here, over the course of, of five different occasions that we did this, initially back in 2002, comparing no-till with conventional till, in the first couple of runoff events that actually produce a runoff from both fields, the abundance of estrogens uh, was reduced. Conventional till, it was about 40% less than the no-till. Turbo till over several years was between about 40 and 60% less. And the most recent where we used this subsurface injection was an 82% reduction, so a dramatic reduction in measurable estrogen. So our summary, I guess, of these controlled field investigations. First, uh, obviously fecal steroids are easily transported off of litter amended fields. Anytime we've done this under any scenario, in any application, we've had measurable estrogens. So uh, that suggests that, that this is something we do need to be aware of. The amount that's transported has an awful lot to do with the precipitation, with the frequency and the intensity. Uh, in conventional till, field, if it's not much precipitation, we don't tend to get much runoff uh, because there's a lot of water absorption capacity. So very frequently, we've had years where we got absolutely no runoff off of the, those fields, and as a consequence, we didn't have any surface water introduction of estrogen. Uh, we've measured groundwater along the way and haven't seen any real issues uh, with transport of estrogens by that route, although it has been reported in the literature. Uh, but Needless to say, that has an awful lot to do with what we're going to find in any given year when our systems are driven entirely by natural rainfall. Um, as a, a very rough rule of thumb, we could say that conventional till uh, was similar to turbo till, and these had reductions of maybe 40 to 60 percent. That subsurface injection had a, a dramatic reduction, as much as 80 percent. Uh, and uh, the real take-home message, of course, is that this runoff, the material that's coming off, is capable of inducing endocrine disruption in fish. It's sufficiently estrogenic. It's still bioactive. Uh, exposure to soil, microbial communities, and other things has not diminished that in such a way that it doesn't still have that capacity. Uh, so going along with all this, we did some actual in situ field investigations where we explored a lot of different areas on the shore where a lot of poultry activity has taken place. Uh, and this is a, a very busy slide, so I'll explain what you're looking at here. Uh, you see the eastern shore in the middle. All of the green dots are poultry operations, and they would probably represent one, or in many cases, more than one poultry house. Uh, and so that's a reasonable estimate of how far the litter is going to travel. Where you see an abundance of these houses, you would expect probably a, a higher abundance of poultry litter within those watersheds. And then if you look at the stars, over the course of uh, the spring of 2004, we sat around, had our van ready, and as soon as we got word that there was going to be a big rain event, these early rain events in the spring, we made a big drive to all of these different locations and we grabbed water samples. Uh, and we weren't always right on time to get this sort of big peak pulse dose of water coming out of some of these places. but we used it as a big survey of the area. And anywhere where you see a green star, we did not have any detectable levels of estradiol. But where you see the blue and the red stars, we did have detectable levels. Uh, and our detection limit at the time was not very good at all. So where we did have detection, that suggested it was a pretty high concentration. So uh, the sites we went to, there was a lot of variety. Many of them were, were very nicely buffered and forested, although they the upper watersheds would have, would have been largely in agriculture. 
Some of them were actually channelized ditches right at, at the, the edge of fields. Uh, and of these various sites of about uh, somewhat in excess of 90 that we visited, uh, two-thirds of them had detectable levels of estradiol. So this gives us the notion that certainly when you target watersheds that have a lot of poultry application in the spring, and when you go during those first real rain events, you have a high likelihood of finding uh, levels in the, the receiving waters. So with that in mind, we figured it would be a good idea to look at some of the biota in these waters. This was our general approach. This is not, uh, I am not in this picture or any of my coworkers. I grabbed this on the web um, because I couldn't find a good one of us, but these guys look pretty sharp. So the idea is that you have a, a backpack electrofishing apparatus. If, if anybody has the opportunity to do this, I recommend it because it's kind of fun. You have a, a source that puts out an electric current so that you can stun the fish and you capture them in the net. Obviously, you want to be cautious and wear waders and so forth so you don't electrocute yourself. Uh, sometimes if you have interns, you have to shock them occasionally just to convince them. Uh, but the result of this, we targeted about 20 sites within the Pocomoke and the Chop Tank watershed, areas that we had been the year before. Uh, and we went to the areas where we had found the highest concentrations of estradiol, figuring they would be a, a logical place to target. And in our various efforts, these were small order streams that we could, we could effectively wade. Uh, we collected about 12 of the most common fish species, um, three of the more common frog species. In total, it was about 500 specimens. And the main thing we were looking at were for effects on uh, the development of the gonad through histology. And our motivation, this was right about the time that the first reports were coming in of intersects in both largemouth bass and smallmouth bass on the Potomac River. Uh, they were first uh, described in 2004. There's a paper by Dr. Blazer, who's with USGS in 2007, that describes their collections over several years. But what they found was a very high prevalence of immature eggs, or oocytes, like these arrows are indicating, within the otherwise normally developing testes of largemouth bass and smallmouth bass. And this was in a lot of different areas in the Potomac River, and in the Shenandoah and some of the, the, the feeders to this, the Monocacy and so forth. And the speculation was that many of these areas, the only real radical thing that had changed there in the, the recent decades had been a fast-growing poultry industry. So there was some notion that that might be at least in part responsible. And of course that inspired us thinking, well, we've had a long-standing substantial poultry industry, so we should probably be looking on the eastern shore. Uh, and the challenge, of course, we had is we went to these 20 sites on the Potomac and the Chop Tank, but being small order streams, we didn't find a whole lot of largemouth bass. There are no smallmouth bass on the eastern shore, so they weren't a target species. But of the various species that we did target, largemouth and smallmouth are the only ones that have been shown to produce these testicular oocytes in any kind of uh, frequency. And in our sampling method, we encountered a total of 25 bass Half of those were male, and of those, two of them were found to have testicular oocytes. So we kind of had an inkling that there might be something going on, but this wasn't really the best strategy to try and, and address it. Uh, we couldn't really do anything statistically rigorous. So we rethought and started deciding that we needed to go to some water bodies where we might find larger fish populations. Uh, and this required going to a number of lakes uh, and in, there are no natural lakes on the eastern shore, so these are impounded water bodies. Uh, I don't think I uh, can use the pointer, but you can see on the chop tank the Tuckahoe Lake and Williston Lake, uh, and then below that actually on the, the, the Nanticoke River is the Williston Lake. And then in Delaware, Moores Lake and Macaulay Pond and Hearns Pond. So all of these have substantial amounts of ag-influenced activity in their upper watershed. Uh, and in the case of all but, I believe, uh, Moore's Lake, they have a minimal uh, sort of human population. There's very little development within the watershed. So these were, were pretty good to target. Uh, they also have the advantage that there's a much longer residence time for the, the water and therefore any contaminants in that water that are entering this system than what you're going to see in some of these flashy small order streams that are immediately adjacent to ag fields. So we targeted these. This is an example of one. This is actually a great place. Williston Lake uh, 
Uh, it's owned by the Girl Scouts. They have a Girl Scout camp here. And what that means is they don't let anybody else fish there. So it is simply loaded with bass. Uh, and that makes it a, a pretty good site for doing this work. But what I want you to see, you can see the lake over on the far left. If you look at the watershed, the two main tributaries feeding it are, are pretty well forested and buffered. But the watershed itself is, is in excess of 70% in ag production. We did a quick sort of cursory count of poultry houses using a, a Google Earth. And, and we got to about 80 uh, that we were certain of. And there's probably something more than that. So you get the idea there's a lot of poultry application here. And despite these, these nice forested edges, the water that's entering this system is largely coming from, from poultry applied ag fields. We had to move to a, a slightly larger electroshocking setup to be able to collect from these. So these are some folks from, uh, in fact, from Delaware, from DINREC that were collecting for us. This works pretty much with the same premise that you, you put an electric current in the water. It makes a much larger electric field here. And the fish are stunned and float up, and you can catch them. We got to get out of the lab for a change and, and set up our little field station here. Uh, the fish would be brought to us, and we would then process them to look for various things. This is one of the, the larger largemouth bass. It comes in. That's about two pounds, for those who are interested. Uh, we got to go to some pretty nice locations, actually, which was fun. But the take-home message, as soon as we started looking at these, pretty frequently, we were running into these testicular oocytes. And these are images showing you a number of the, the samples that we, that we encountered. Collectively, in 2008, of the six ponds or lakes that we went to, we found occurrences of between 40 and 88 uh, percent. So the, the prevalence that happened from the fish we collected in these ponds were at that level. We went back in 2009, sampled from Tuckahoe in the spring and the summer. There was some suggestion that these can actually be spawned out. And there's a lot of evidence to support that. But the idea might be that the prevalence would go down if we looked after the spawn versus before the spawn. So we collected in Tuckahoe in the spring and the summer, and also down on the Pocomoke River, uh, some areas down near Snow Hill. Uh, and we didn't actually see that. We, we got some conflicting results here, probably in relation to fairly small sample sizes. But the take home is, over two years of sampling, we found prevalences of, of testicular oocytes at 40 to 8, or excuse me, 33 to 88%. And this falls very comfortably with levels that are reported elsewhere, especially on the, the Western Shore and the Potomac, um, that have been drawing a lot of attention. And in fact, nationally, they've done some studies with both smallmouth and largemouth in a lot of areas that are pretty severely impacted, either by animal agriculture or by industrial effluence. And this compares rather favorably with that, or maybe I should say not favorably. These, these would be levels that you would expect in impacted waters. Uh, maybe on the good side, if you look at the severity, uh, and it was sort of a complex process of taking multiple sections through the fish and estimating by the number of oocytes you encountered just how severe this was. But we found severities that ranged from a, a 0.11 to 0.53, which are generally less than what's been reported in the Potomac. They were finding prevalences, or excuse me, severities uh, consistently above 0.6, and in some cases up uh, around 2, which is, uh, I realize you have a, a, no way to picture this, but that's finding a tremendous number of oocytes within the, these fish. Uh, but our prevalences, or excuse me, our severities were significantly higher than what are found in reference sites, areas that are considered minimally impacted, that are well forested and have a minimal amount of agriculture and human activity. So it puts us sort of in the middle ground where it's still something we need to, to consider. We've tried to take this full circle. We run into the problem that establishing causality in field studies is essentially impossible, uh, especially with a fish that the, the most egregious symptom you're seeing is the prevalence of testicular oocytes. And these don't tend to show up until the fish is one to two or three years old. Uh, and it's entirely possible that the exposure is something that occurs when they are very young fish. Uh, they have long lifespans. They are exposed to a complex uh, amounts and frequencies of, of contaminants. So we're trying to bring this back to the lab and reproduce the fathead minnow studies that we've done looking at largemouth bass. I'm trying to establish this proof of concept that the poultry litter associated contaminants are actually able to induce these effects. Uh, and of course, this still is not going to prove causality in field collected fish, but it will allow us to, 
to improve our studies a bit. We can identify the windows of sensitivity, whether it's early life exposure that leads to this, or whether it might be just immediately prior to spawning, for example. Uh, and the challenge is that they're long-lived, uh, and uh, the biggest one is to do this in the lab requires more of an aquaculture kind of setup than a traditional aquatic toxicology lab. So we're working our way through this. We've started this process. We got a little pilot study started last year with some, some money from uh, the college, uh, and we managed to get some students involved. I have a gemstone group, a group of, of really capable undergraduates, uh, and we started looking at this. This is one image of a fish where we're about to dissect out the, the testes and look at it. I'm going to give you just a teaser. The first results that we've seen, we've actually demonstrated that you can induce vitelligen in, in largemouth bass by exposing them to poultry litter. Uh, it was a very slight induction, and, and we had some, some curious confounding results that our estradiol control didn't cause anything. So this is very much a work in progress. but but we're starting this test to see if the species that's most of interest in the actual field collections is also sensitive the way species that we've worked with in the lab are. Um, I have one more slide after this, but I, I wasn't sure where I would be on time, so I just want to acknowledge there have been a tremendous number of people that have been involved in this work. Uh, other uh, researchers at the Y Research and Education Center, Daniel Fisher and, and a lot of coworkers, Greg Ziegler and Elizabeth Friedel, uh, and so forth. I'm not going to go through this whole list, but you can see we've had buy-in from other universities and from many agencies uh, in the federal government and Maryland DNR and even some, some other groups, the Bay Foundation, Riverkeeper Alliance, and so forth. So they've been a big part of this. Um, and actually, I will stop there. Groundwater. Are we seeing an increase in levels in groundwater? We are not. Um, we have done so on the fields that I showed, we, they are actually instrumented with, with wells to, uh, to sample movement of estrogens across these fields. And we have found in only one instance a very minimal detection. So in truth, while we can find substantial concentrations in surface runoff, by the time it makes it down into groundwater, whether it, it's sorbing to soils, whether there's microbial degradation or uh, deconjugation and other things, we are not finding concentrations in groundwater at all. It has been reported elsewhere. Uh, there would be no health effects associated with, with these endocrine-related endpoints. Uh, in fish, and especially with largemouth bass, your biggest concern uh, is mercury. Uh, and this is a reflection of, of release of mercury, especially from coal-fired power plants that accumulates uh, and gets methylated in wetlands. Wetlands are great for so many things, but one of their downsides is they're very effective at taking uh, elemental mercury and methylating it and making it an organic mercury. Uh, and once they do that, this methyl mercury accumulates up the food chain, and therefore these fish that we really like to catch, like largemouth bass, these climax predators, end up having very high concentrations of it. So. You tend to see in any of these lakes, I, I should have actually taken a picture of it, there's a sign right by the boat ramp if you're going to go in and fish there that says don't eat these fish or don't eat more than one serving a month because of the accumulated mercury in them. Uh, but nothing about these guys having a, first of all, you're not going to eat the, the, the testis in these fish, but there's no accumulation of the contaminants that, that we're particularly concerned with within this tissue. Given the data that you provided regarding the increased size of birds, the reason feed requirements, and reduced time to maturity between the time of day, were any of these studies conducted using heritage breed types? Uh, none were conducted by, by us. One thing we did do was take some poultry litter from one of the, uh, well, I wouldn't even call it poultry litter. We took the, the actual bird feces collected from one of the experimental flocks here at College Park and just looked at it for estrogens and it fell exactly in the same concentrations as the other. So this is simply a reflection of the, of the physiology of these birds. They are growing very fast. Uh, they are, even though they are immature, they are of mixed gender, you tend to still see a pretty consistent production and excretion of these fecal steroids. Uh, I wouldn't be able to say about heritage varieties whether, whether they might. 
uh, be different, but that's certainly possible because, well, you run into the issue that to get them to market size, you keep them two or three times longer. So the dynamics of what happens in, the, in the, their manure, things may degrade more effectively or, or not, but, but you're going to have the bird longer and you're going to create a greater abundance of litter uh, as a consequence. Lance, you had shown, I believe, on one of your slides that um, you did a lot of sampling in the spring, uh, right before the rains happened, and saw elevated levels of estrogens after those samplings. And I was wondering, is is what's the worst case scenario? Is it worse to have kind of a steady stream of this entering our surface waters, or is it worse to have a heavy dose of it in the spring so that, due to that's the right, due to the, all the spring manure application? Yeah, so I've been, we've been asking for money because this is very complicated and difficult work to do. The chemistry, uh, we end up having to pay a lot to get the analyses, and the result is that we are given numbers that are so low or below detection, and yet we can expose fish and we can cause something to happen. So it becomes a very complicated formula. I had some slides I didn't want to put up, but I'll describe... If you first introduce poultry litter, the way we shake it up in the lab so that it's analogous to a runoff scenario, we take a certain amount of it, we shake it up, we measure the ammonia or various other things to, to see if it's approximately representative of what we've seen in runoff, and then we put it in a big tank, and we'll have maybe 800 gallons of it, and this will serve as a, as a uh, mesocosm that we might put our fish in, but we measure the concentrations of the estrogens in this water over the course of a month letting it sit static. We'll, we'll gently aerate it a little bit for the, for the fish, but we'll let it sit static. And we'll measure the abundance of the estradiol and the estrone, which are the two most potent female estrogens. But we'll also use some in vitro assays that just measure total estrogenicity. So it's the bioactivity, and it, it doesn't care what compound is, is contributing this. It just gives you a level. And what we see very consistently is at time zero, when we first introduce it, we have fairly low levels. And over the course of, of three or four days to as much as a week or nine days, this activity goes up, and dramatically so in many cases, three or four fold above the, the initial level. And the explanation, we, we kind of understand it intellectually, but it's very hard to get the chemistry to back it up. Most of these estrogens, for the birds to be able to excrete them, they conjugate them uh, by attaching a functional group that makes them water soluble so they can actually get them out of their system. And they stay in this form when they're in the manure. This makes them water soluble so they're very prone to wash off the field. They go into solution and, and very easily. But in this form, they're not very bioactive. But the first thing that happens, these attached group, groups are things like glucuronides, which is a big sugar. And it's very attractive to uh, bacteria. So the microbial community in the receiving environments immediately starts to cleave these conjugates off and they free up the original native hormone that is much more bioactive. So the process, this is a long answer to your question I realize, but the long and short is when you first dump it in you don't have very much. If it's a static system you'll measure higher activity in a week. If it's a flowing system and it's being contributed from a lot of different tributaries that ultimately lead to a single impounded water body, you may see if, depending on the nature of the rain and when application has happened, it could be days or weeks after that you start seeing higher abundances. If this coincides with when the fish are spawning or when the larval fish are resident in these ponds and water bodies, then it's likely that it can have an effect. If you miss it by a month, then it's likely that you won't see anything. So teasing these out, we can design lab studies to allow us to, to presume many of these things and try and challenge them. But there's so much variety in the environment, it's difficult to say what would be a worst case scenario or which of these is worse, that it comes off incrementally and slowly in groundwater or if it runs off substantially but in one large pulse in a, in a uh, surface application. Uh, some integrators have gone to a five to eight year clean out cycle. Um, well, I'll tell you, we haven't done any specific work with that, but we have 
just done a tiny little study looking at composting. In fact, we've just proposed a, a larger project project to look at composting of, of poultry litter. We've done a little bit with biosolids, and we've seen a, that it's pretty effective. Uh, and I realize this isn't the same thing, but going for five to eight years in these clean-out cycles, you're going to have a very different microbial community, and, and what's going to occur in that time frame, I would assume that most of the oldest steroids that have been introduced are going to be long gone. So while they're still there at this two-year cycle, what we might be seeing in that is all the newest material. So in this five to eight year, you would expect it to be proportionally much less. Uh, but that, that's just a guess. This, this work has not been done. Um, it would be interesting. I know a lot of people are going to doing windrowing in the, in the houses. That, it's very short. It's not really a full composting process. The temperature probably is not particularly helpful. These aren't, aren't denatured in any meaningful way by the, the temperatures that are achieved. Uh, so I don't know if that's effective. But there's, what I described before was kind of how everybody did things six to, to 50 years ago, I guess. Uh, there's a lot of variety out there now, so it would be interesting to look around and see if there are differences in these things. Much of what we did, especially with the field work, ran right alongside a lot of, of very intensive nutrient analyses. Uh, this was the work Ken Staver was doing. They, they didn't complement exactly because we were collecting during these first rain events, uh, whereas his system basically analyzes over the entirety of the year the total amount of nutrients that come off of these fields. So when we went back and made comparisons, uh, we had some sort of apples and oranges we had to deal with. But where I put up the, the information about the, the reduction in nutrient, or excuse me, in estrogens based on tillage practice, those actually corresponded very well with the nutrients that were measured during those rain events. Now, they didn't necessarily correspond to what happened on these fields over the entire year. So if you're just looking for a nutrient management plan that's looking at total abundance of, of nitrogens or, or, or phosphorus coming off the field, it may not be relevant. But the interesting finding is that things that reduce nutrients in these early rain events are also effective at reducing these steroids. So if the management strategy takes into account not just the total over the course of an entire year, but some of these earlier events, it's going to be largely protective uh, if protection is necessary, if these potential things actually manifest as real problems. It's going to be effective at reducing steroids coming off the field. It's going to be effective at reducing antibiotics coming off the field. Uh, presumably, it would be effective in, in just about anything else that we might be concerned with. So uh, it's, groundwater would be another another story. but. But that work isn't really done yet with the antibiotics, so 